Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for free premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. You know, every generation has its signature, right? Every generation does things a little bit differently and they challenge the way we think about the world. Well, right now, one of the hallmarks, so this is new, one of the hallmarks of this generation is that they're throwing the idea of age out the window in boxing. I haven't seen anything remotely resembling this. Understand, I'm from an era where if you were a boxer and you were nearing 35, people knew that you were near the end of the road, right? If you look at even historical fighters, like let's say Marvelous Marvin Hagler, he's out of the game by the time he's 35 years old. Now, in boxing today, that's just changed. I don't know how else to put it. It could be that fighters fight fewer times a year. This isn't Ray Robinson's era where guys are fighting every month or so. Now guys fight a couple times a year. I know Floyd fights Cinco de Mayo weekend and the second week of September, right? Guys are on schedules now if you have the marketing power, right? So they're fighting less. There's also more out there in terms of tape that's readily available. The advent of the internet and online video allows people to literally sit down and watch several fights of their opponents, right? They don't have to hunt down film. They can watch and they can trade, right? It's easy to swap these, you know, digital files. They can trade tapes of their opponent. And maybe that has helped fighters prepare better for fights and protect themselves better. And of course, there are technological breakthroughs in nutrition that allow guys to keep muscle mass longer. So we're in an era where, let's name names, where the best fighter pound for pound in the sport, according to many, Floyd Mayweather is 30 seven years of age, right? The most widely accepted heavyweight champion of the world, Vladimir Klitschko, is 38 years of age. Let's just look at traditional weight classes for a moment. With all due respect to 36-year-old Carl Frotch, who holds two of the belts at 168 super middle. But let's avoid light welter super middle for a second and just look at traditional weight classes the light heavyweight champion right one of them anyway bernard hopkins and keep in mind when i say one of them i'm talking about a guy who's unified he actually holds more than one belt we're not talking about fringe champions here bernard hopkins he's 49 years old just take a look at middleweight now, Sergio Martinez right now holds one of the belts. He's 39. This video is actually about the man who just won the IBF middleweight belt, Sam Solomon, who is 40 years of age. Folks, I'm telling you, this is new. When you're talking about older champions now, defying age limits, Right? You have several in several weight classes. Let me point out, too, Manny Pacquiao is in his mid-30s. Juan Manuel Marquez is either 39 or 40. You have guys just outside of the championship. Guillermo Jones, Felix DeCat, for example. Look at his age. I believe he's either late 30s or early 40s. Right, This age anomaly now is becoming a new paradigm that involves not just reigning champions, but also contenders. Now let's talk about Sam Solomon. I've posted a link to the fight on my channel page. You want to watch the fight, 
before they take it off YouTube. All right now, let me just say a couple of things on Sam Solomon. You know, back in my day, right, when I first started watching boxing, we had a saying. The saying was, the legs are the first to go, right? The idea is the legs go first, right? Power is supposed to be <laughs> the last thing to go, right? But the legs are supposed to go early, right? When you look at 40-year-old Sam Solomon, you're going to realize that he has some of the best legs in boxing. His legs are his calling card, right? He's very mobile. He's certainly much more mobile than 35-year-old, now former champion, Felix Sturm, right? So Solomon is able to move around the ring. Right, he moves around the ring I the way I had hoped George Groves, who should watch a tape of this fight, should have moved around the ring against Carl Frotch. Right? Solomon moves. He's a mover. Right? Let me point out too, in, in a day and age where a lot of guys feel that the secret to boxing is to be very heavy on your front foot. Sam Solomon is very heavy on his back foot. You're going to notice that he leans back on his back foot a lot. Let's also talk about defense. You know, people think defense is just being able to, you know, raise a hand and block a punch. I believe defense starts before the punch is even thrown. Sam Solomon has the gift that Sergio Martinez has in that he knows how to hide his upper body, right? He's moving and he's bending, right? The bend allows him to bend under punches. He's five, eight and a half. He uses his height to his benefit because his opponent typically is taller than him. So Solomon is moving and he's bending. He'll also bend his knees. He has a mobile center of gravity, right? So it's very hard to try to hit him in the body. Solomon is moving too much. His body is not stationary enough to get hit in the same spot with regularity. Right, let me make another point, and I think this is really key for his match against Felix Stern. Right, Sam Solomon controls the point of exchange. Right, we'll make up a term here. I'm talking about the moment when the fighters start throwing punches in an interaction. In other words, the two guys get together, Sam Solomon, because he's able to kind of bob and weave he'll hit you first, right? He has a nice little quick jab. He decides when the first punch lands. If the other guy throws first, Solomon's not there to get hit, right? Solomon is the kind of guy who, like Roy Jones in his prime, right, isn't sitting at the chessboard to play chess. In fact, he's not sitting down at all. He's standing up and he's away from the chessboard because he knows the moves don't start until he gets to the chessboard. So then, of course, he darts to the chessboard, makes a move, then he backs away. He's very hard to time. He's very hard to develop a punch sequence for. A guy like Felix Sturm is a master chess player with an excellent jab. Sturm is accustomed to coming and then having a series of moves, an interaction with his opponent. Sturm doesn't know what to do when the opponent is not at the chessboard. The opponent's darting around the ring. Then the opponent comes in, hits, and runs. Right? It's even worse than that. It's not a hit and run. He hits Sturm. Sturm fires back. Solomon ducks the punch. Then he comes in with... Not a counter punch, but a counter combination. Right? So, someone like Sturm, and keep in mind, this is the second time the two guys fought. 
someone like Sturm doesn't quite know how to put the punches together against an opponent like this. Because a Sturm in preparing for a fight will think of, let's say, I hit the jab, I throw one to the body, I'm going to do this, I do this, he does that, I do this, he does that. When you're fighting Sam Solomon, you can't do this to start the exchange because Solomon's too crafty. He's like this, right? Then Solomon comes in, lands, your entire punch sequence is off. Let me also point out too, that if you're lucky enough to get close enough to Solomon, Solomon is one of the premier clinchers in the sport. He's a master at clinching. Keep in mind, clinching isn't just tying up your opponent. No, the best clinchers will clinch to tie up only part of their opponent. They'll keep a hand free so they can continue to hit you. They'll actually hit you with a clinch to break up your combination. Then they'll disengage from the clinch. Right? Once, once Solomon puts a hand up and ties up your right hand, he'll then drop that hand. Keep in mind, he's not throwing a punch. He's throwing a clinch. Once he clinches your right hand so that your momentum's gone and he's hitting you with this hand, he'll actually disengage this hand to continue with his own combination. Look at the fight. You're going to see that often the ref's not the one breaking up the clinch. Rather, Sam Solomon is initiating the clinch and then he's breaking it up and throwing a combination. Right? The third round is crucial. I want people to look at the third round. The referee is a veteran ref. It's Eddie Cotton. You're going to see that Sam Solomon comes in, clinches, is turning Felix Stern. Right? Keep in mind, a clinch is not just about tying up a guy. It's about tying up and turning a guy. He's coming in. He's clinching. He's turning Felix Stern. It looks like roughhouse tactics. In my opinion, Solomon's doing nothing wrong. He gets worn multiple times by Eddie Cotton. Right? But Cotton doesn't deduct the point. But when you look at that third round, I don't believe you're going to see fouling. I believe what you're going to see is mastery. Right? Part of Solomon's game. And keep in mind, this is a guy on his back foot who is dictating and choosing his point of entry, his point of exchange. Right? It's surprising that a guy on his back foot is actually the guy in the ring who is the more physical person in clinches. But that's the contradiction that is the new IBF middleweight champion. Right? Factor in age, and it's even more surprising. You think you're fighting a 40-year-old. Then you find out he has better legs than you. Then you find out he's the one who's better inside, in between punches, clinching and muscling you. Right? And, of course, there's the angle problem. He's 5'8 and a half, he's shorter than you, and he's ducking down. He's moving around. Right? He's hard to time. Right? It's a problem. If you research Solomon's background a bit, you're going to find that he was a kickboxer before he became a boxer. Right? His legs are still far better than that of most of his opponents. Right? A guy like Solomon is going to dominate slow-footed opponents who have a hard time keeping up with more mobile guys, right? Solomon, to me, also is a master at being off-key, right? He's the kind of guy, let me name another name, and I know this guy's past his prime, I'm just naming him for style, Jorge Arce, 
right? Excellent fighter who has seen better days, but who has beaten some technicians in his career, right? Understand, a guy like Jorge Arce who keeps his head tilted away and he's throwing looping punches and he's doing things that aren't textbook is very effective because he's impossible to duplicate in training camp right you can't get a sparring partner to fight like Jorge Arce and the technicians don't know what to do with the guy who runs red lights right Arce is in the ring speaking a different language than them they're accustomed to opponents doing things a certain way and here's a guy who's outside the box that's Solomon Solomon in some ways is a lot like Sergio Martinez only without the punch if you see Solomon in a fight against a guy who's slower leg and who's more technical right what we call technical understand there's a technique to what Solomon's doing there's a method to the madness but what we call technical guys thinking about punch combinations guys trying to bank body shots early guys holding their hands a certain way right guys doing footwork a certain way understand a lot of that doesn't work against a guy who has let's say a physical trait that's outside the box in Solomon's case it's his feet right in other words he's much faster much more unusual darts around the ring a lot more than a typical fighter right when you combine that with the fact that Solomon can hide his upper body an opponent is gonna have too much to think about let me just say Sturm's fascinating because Sturm has one of the sports better jabs you wouldn't tell it from this fight because the jabs not landing the fact that Solomon is able to take away Sturm's jab is an eye opener Sturm's jab never becomes a factor in the fight he can't find Solomon because Solomon moves too well Solomon's not in the same place long enough to get hit repeatedly with the jab right so people need to pay close attention to what's happening at middleweight because this Solomon coronation the fact that he's the new IBF champion opens the door to a lot for example now Daniel Gill doesn't have to go through Gennady Golovkin for a shot at the title he can fight his countryman Sam Solomon in what would be a blockbuster down under for the title that Gill used to have that he lost to Stern right actually that he lost to Darren Barker who then lost to Stern right so that would be Gill's chance at redemption Anthony Mundy probably put up the most impressive performance against Sam Solomon in the past he too is viable as an opponent in a blockbuster fight for the middleweight title down under right just food for thought let me say this and I know I pick on this guy a lot and I'm gonna pick on him here if I'm Peter Quillen I would have to realize even though I'm unbeaten that I simply don't have the legs or the volume of Sam Solomon he's a dangerous opponent Quillen would have to land early and land hard like he did against Hassan and Jacob to win that fight because without a knockout I don't see how Quillen would beat Sam Solomon right food for thought right as for Gennady Golovkin it gets interesting right Golovkin's a big name at 160 pounds 
The question is whether Golovkin can hunt down, literally walk down, in the division. A Sergio Martinez, who I expect to beat Miguel Cotto, we'll see what happens, right? Or whether Golovkin would be able to walk down Sam Solomon, right? I don't know. I think it's an open question. Right? I'll agree Solomon's 40 years old. I'll agree common sense would tell us, gee, you have a young lion in against a 40-year-old, right, who has to be high energy to win fights, who relies on his legs to win fights. He relies on his legs in a way that guys like Hopkins and Vladimir Klitschko and Juan Manuel Marquez, other guys who or a little bit older, don't, right? Juan Manuel Marquez isn't in there dancing around the ring for 12 rounds to beat you, right? Solomon's a high wire act. He's older, but he's high energy, right? The problem, though, Golovkin is going to face is simply in closing the distance on Solomon. right? If Golovkin stays back like he likes to, Golovkin actually isn't as front foot heavy as people think. If Golovkin stays back like he likes to, analyzing the lay of the land, he's going to lose the early rounds in that fight. Right? You know, so then he'll be in a position where he's going to have to try to hunt down a guy who is very hard to find. Right? Golovkin's going to have to try to, you know, figure out a way to get close so that his hooks matter. And that's going to be a challenge, right? So take a look at Sam Solomon and understand he is the IBF middleweight champion. He's in the middle of a lot of what's going on in boxing, right? If the middleweight division is going to be unified, if guys are going to fight unification matches, he's in the mix. And he would be a very difficult opponent for slower-footed opponents. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.